What do I've been wrong. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the November 14, 2018 uh, special Scarborough Town Council meeting, swearing in ceremony of newly elected officials. It's always a great day when we have newly elected officials and uh, 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 new newly elected officers. Uh, Jean Marie is going to be a few minutes late. Uh, had a, uh, a matter she had to attend to, uh, but will be here shortly. And I'd ask all of you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Uh, item three, swearing in of newly elected officials. Town clerk is in charge of this. And we will. That would be great. Move these away. Just go over. Just like that. Move the side. Move the side. If I could have you raise your right arm and repeat after me. I please state your name. I, Don Hill. I, Paul Johnson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Okay. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of the state. And of the state. So long as I shall. So long as I shall. Continue a citizen thereof. Continue a citizen thereof. I restate your name. I, Paul Johnson. Do swear. Do swear. That I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. The duties incumbent upon me. The duties incumbent upon me. As a member of the town council. As a member of the town council. According to the constitution and the laws of the state. According to the constitution and the laws of the state. And the charter of the town of Scarborough. And the charter of the town of Scarborough. Congratulations. I just need to Uh, at this point in the meeting, uh, the town clerk assumes the responsibility of overseeing uh, action on the election of new town officers. Order number 18-077 is act on the request for nominations and the election of a new town council chair. At this time, I will open the floor for nominations. I would like to nominate Councillor Peter Hayes. Second. Any other? There being none, all those in favor? You can vote oh, for yourself. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. Congratulations. Change seats. Make sure you grab your new plate. Thank you. Oh. It's a left-handed gavel, but I think it'll work for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and we'd just like to thank our former chair, Bill, for your service and all that you've done and thank your you. leadership over the past years. It's big shoes to fill, so I'm sure I'll have a lot of support and coaching. So glad to be here. Um, now it's order number 18078, which is act on a request for nomination election of a new town council vice chair. And I guess at this point I'll open it up to nominations. I nominate Councillor Katie Foley. Second. Any discussion? Any other nominations? I guess with that, all those in favor? Thank you. Well, um, two seven, unanimous seven. votes right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> the vote was 7 0, so thank you. Um, and I guess the next item on the agenda is for a roll call this evening. Councillor Baybine? Present. Councillor Johnson? Present. Councillor Foley? Here. Councillor Hamill? Here. Councillor Donovan? Here. Chairman Hayes? Here. 
And with that, at this point, we're going to move into sort of a workshop on a, count, uh, a, a total town council discussion of the downtown TIF and CEA and just kind of have a conversation among ourselves. We also have some folks in the audience. Steve Wren is here that did some of the financial analysis for us and other things. So with that, I think we'll adjourn to the, to the table for the workshop. It's a small, small world. So. I'm not sure who worked for who really. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think the intent of tonight was we do have two new council members that have been kept up to speed, but I think they may have some questions or comments. So I think this is just an open discussion of, of where we are and where we find ourselves. And anything anybody wants to, to put forth as questions or comments or
that I've seen indicated that this is a, not an audio issue, but a, it's a matter of, you know, trying to pin a number, trying to understand, you know, that so we can verify. And I have a sense that the number was somehow, you know, deduced rather than built up. So we know there's a confidentiality issue that's been raised about this. That notwithstanding, this is an essential part of the agreement and also one that was, I think it was the third part of the tentative agreement outline that was set out at the beginning. So I want to just highlight those two at a high level. I don't really know how we wade into that, but there's a lot of detail behind it. Those are the main ones. There are also a number of other things. As I look through the agreement and I read the contract language, there are things missing. I believe there is plenty of detail highlighting upside opportunities for the developer and very, very little detail in terms of how we are going to quantify and evaluate performance requirements on the other side, you know, of the deal if things are performance hurdles or not. So anyway, that's sort of like the broad overview before we wade in. Tom, do you want to address any of those or any thoughts? I think it's a fair point that was made that the modeling is based on the market analysis and the forecast and the desired scenario. Kind of after the fact, through the process, we also, not after the fact, but during the process, we also wanted to model what does the scenario look like without partnership. But we've not gone further and modeled other scenarios and there's arguably, you know, dozens of scenarios that we could. So we certainly have that ability, but we've not undertaken that task. I think what we have done, though, is to try to guard against those through a number of the performance measures that we've put in place and also the caps, particularly around residential construction. Those were directly designed to try to shape this thing in a direction and have it land in a general direction that's favorable to us. So that's how we've tried to manage to that desired end. In terms of funding of infrastructure, I do have our town engineer. She's just this week been provided information, the detailed information on those cost takeoffs, and I expect that work will certainly be turned around and available to you before you take a vote. I can let Councillor Donovan speak to this, but that was clearly a discussion point throughout. In fact, you've mentioned the fact that it made its way onto multiple tentative agreements through the course of this process. And frankly, it was just a piece that was kind of missed through the final drafting. I'm not so sure it needs and should be part of the formal CEA anyway, but I think it's something that needs to be verified before final vote and certainly before final signature on the CEA. Based on the numbers that they've been provided to us, and we need to verify those, it seems as though the total reimbursement that they're eligible for is well within their expected infrastructure cost, but we need to verify that, and that's what the exercise is all about. And I guess the last point you made on needing better measures or better ways to quantify and evaluate performance, we spent a lot of time trying to identify the metrics, because no one wants to get into a fight down the road as to whether the performance measures have been satisfied. We think we've identified pretty measurable metrics for us to look at. We've even gone so far to recognize that there may be some dispute and that the council is the arbiter of that dispute. So we've tried to work through those issues. Undoubtedly, there may be some we haven't entirely identified or addressed, but nothing you mentioned is kind of brand new. I guess the thought that I have is that the way to check the risks associated with the downside was to determine whether or not the market analyses and cost analyses were done in an appropriate manner. And confirm and verify was a phrase that we used to indicate that we had our eyes wide open. Steve Brin and Matt Newcaster both issued reports that, and these are 
these are uh, highly experienced professionals that indicated the analysis was solid. Uh, so it gave me a sense that we weren't uh, we weren't uh, presenting a proposal that was likely to have a large downsize risk. Now, scenario two does show kind of a, that's the do nothing, no deal. Uh, and that does show you, that would probably be an example of a worst case scenario, uh, which again shows the town uh, uh, would make some money off it, but uh, much less. Uh, as far as uh, measuring performance, uh, I guess uh, uh, the final arbiter of that is the town council. Uh, the town manager has to use a good faith determination that they're being met. Uh, I think there's always the opportunity to be able to sharpen those up, clarify, make sure if there are questions that the developer has, how are you going to deal with this or that we might have, how are you going to do with that? That kind of tweaking is fine with me because we've, you know how you get, you look at something a hundred times and we really have, many of us looked at it repeatedly and you kind of look past some things. So fresh eyes, I think, have a real benefit. And so uh, as you identify that sort of thing of, what about this? I, I listen carefully. I take it, I don't take offense because uh, you can kind of just simply, simply miss something. Well, I, I think throughout the, the council has been accommodating and has adjusted time frames and have been uh, very helpful in terms of giving us, you know, even the, the time that, the short time that we had to deal with and making that, you know, um, um, productive for us in terms of their openness and, and their encouragement for us to talk with others. I, I would push back again on the idea of a downside risk. Scenario one and scenario two are both upside scenarios that, and Maybe scenario two is a, a more downside scenario than scenario one, but they're both still showing a successful uh, project. I'm talking about things like what happens, heaven forbid, if uh, um, you know our partners walk away from the deal or they decide to sell it to someone else. Um, based on our reading of the contract language, it'd be possible for for them to walk away without really having fulfilled any performance requirements, have no, no penalty essentially, and um, the, the new buyer would be able to come in and just pick up the, precisely the same terms that, are, that exist there today with, uh, with the person, with the author of this project. So that, that is, that's troubling to me. And um, uh, the analogy I draw also is in terms of you look at the performance standards on these things. Normally, there's a there's a minimum performance level. Well, in the first ten years, um, the developer will be entitled to forty percent of the of the captured value, um, and um, the only trigger, the only gate for that, is at the end of year ten. Uh, a lot can happen in that time frame. How do we know? How will we know? that we are on a trajectory for success. And is I know it's not exactly like a revenue projection where there's a build year after year, and I've looked at that in detail. You know, like, I think we're on track for $170,000 or something like that after year, the first year of the 30-year agreement in terms of value that be created potentially. But how, how, how do we do that if all hell breaks loose, which could happen? And we're not predicting it, and it may have low probability. However, I if we're being asked to really uh, put our thumbprint on this deal, uh, I've got to have some line of sight and some comfort level to that. And, it, and at this moment, I have none. Well, I can say that we introduced the notion of earlier checkpoints um, very early on in the discussions. And I, the developers here, they can speak for themselves. But I, I do recall distinctly that uh, the issue that they brought to our attention is that um, that really the shorter time frame that we're thinking about, maybe a five year for conversation points, 
really doesn't give them much time to perform. Yeah. They've got a lot of money to yeah. sink in the ground before they even start <coughs> yep. construction of any sort. So, um, and it became abundantly clear that uh, the deal that we've kind of uh, brought forward here is really an infrastructure only deal. And from their perspective, it's really about securing, um, using this as a, a foothold or a piece of collateral to secure other financing to make significant investment in sooner than later. Yeah. And um, that's really what this, this, the elements of this deal are about at this point. Yeah. Um, that, that's a fair point. So I just, the, I, I wanna, don't want to suck all the oxygen out of the room. So no, it's a good you know, discussion. I, just, I, 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 think wanna, it's, I think it's helpful to, um, to hear those. But let me, let me just speak to uh, some of the things you raised. I mean, the failure to perform, if it's a disaster, well, in the first instance, it's a disaster for Scarborough Downs owners because they don't get anything. If there's zero revenue to speak of during the first five years, well, they're already in the ground out there. They're, they're spending money. They're in front of the planning board, have already got phase one approved. Uh, they're, they're going forward with all their own money. And the tax revenue that is created, if you look at the tables, is in the sense of what will eventually be brought forward for tax revenue, is really thin during the early years. So uh, this, the risk really rests on the developer in the early years. Uh, uh, it is an incentive-based program. That really is the, the way we, we structured it, that if they want to do well, they have to perform. If they don't do well, then they, don't, they won't get much money because there won't be much in the way of tax revenue. And if they decide to sell, they have to get our approval to sell. So that's, uh, now we can't unreasonably withhold that approval, but we do have the right to decide whether that's permitted or not. And we put that right in the agreement. I wanted the public to be aware of that. Yeah, I, I would just, um, and thanks for pointing that out. Uh, I, and I, I, I didn't respond to the point that was made earlier that the, the developers clearly, uh, you know, assume a lot of risk and there are long lead times that um, folks who aren't builders don't realize. You know, so it, there's a long lead time, and we went through some of this the other day, you know, of five or ten years just to kind of get things going in order for it to be ready, you know, at the end of that of that hurdle, the performance hurdle that's in there, the only one that raised one. Um, but the fact remains that if something bad happened, and with that language about we can't, you know, unreasonably withhold something, it's really very general language. That would be very hard to enforce. Uh, I would not be happy with that in, in an agreement that I would sign. And I just think there there is simply language missing otherwise that, um, we might need in order to protect the town for uh, where we might be without a developer and infrastructure not built, however significant residential construction built with the associated um, costs to serve for that. And, you know, with the town actually being underwater in terms of, you know, the, the additional costs associated with that, cost to serve and costs of, of schools. So, so I'm, uh, you know, I like to think of myself as an optimistic person, uh, as somebody, and I, I know builders are, developers certainly are, the guys with the vision to do something that's this big <coughs> and, and ambitious. It's bold. Uh, and I, you know, there are many things about it that I like. Uh, however, there, there are, those are just a couple of basic concerns, and I have more detailed questions to get into specifics in terms of the language. Um, I read very carefully Mr. Brin's um, analysis, and um, you know I was impressed by that. I it was also interesting that he pointed out there's no capital risk to the town in the first phase, you know, because there is no capital outlet. However, um, by the funding mechanism that we have, we essentially are 
making it possible to provide the developers with something they can use for collateral in order to help them for cash flow. There's no secret there. That's a fact. Um, uh, however, it's, it's not like there isn't any value at stake uh, or any risk at stake to the town. So that, that's my kind of like wind up. Um, and um, uh, when I've worked on very complex issues and projects, um, I find that when we rush to solve something, that very often a large complex problem is not ready to be solved. And I've had that feeling repeatedly uh, as a bystander, uh, and I feel that very intensely now. Uh, so I just I thought I'd leave it there with the preamble. Thank you. Shana, do you have any comments uh, really on the, the downside risk um, issue that you brought forward? Um, well, so so the last point that was raised about sort of this the capital outlay is not on the town side for the infrastructure; it's on the developer side. But obviously, there's a credit enhancement agreement that's making that possible. Um, there there definitely are are um, you know is a, there's less risk on the town as a result of that dynamic because you don't then as a town obligate yourself to making debt service payments you're only making a percentage of whatever happens to be generated and increase assessed value there so um, the risk that that's not enough to cover the costs of that debt service whatever it may be that risk is on the developer and so that's why it's an advantage for the town to structure it this way and to not have take that um, capital outlay uh, on its own balance sheet. It's also going to help us going forward in our future bond issues and our bond ratings and all that to, to keep that on the developer side. So I just wanted to respond on that point. Um, the other thing, and I, I think um, I think uh, now Councillor Donovan <laughs> responded to, appropriately on, on the assignment provision, which is for assignments for purposes other than for financing the project itself, um, the consent of the town council is required, and the language is that it shall not be unreasonably withheld. That language you'll find in every credit enhancement agreement that Scarborough has entered into, and every credit enhancement agreement I think that, that I have seen in the state of Maine. Um, that's not to say it can't necessarily be improved upon, but there is, um, there is a dynamic in that language where um, the council will have an opportunity to say, not, not this assignment, because of some identifiable reason you can point to that you would have to defend or I would have to defend in a court to say this is a reasonable uh, refusal for, for this consent. Um, I can't tell you that I've been through a court case on that particular issue, um, but that, that's um, the explanation for where that language comes from, and it's very difficult to identify language to put in this contract today that would encapsulate that future scenario. So, but, but certainly if, um, if there's something we can think of specifically that would make a reasonable um, refusal understandable, um, we can talk about that. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I quickly just for clarification. So a refusal, I mean, it must be a pretty high bar. I mean, it must be, you know, felonies or some, some I mean, what, what would qualify as, as a reason to say no? I mean, I think that's that's really a question for you all. You do have the discretion, well, I mean, and, well, you and said, your... but it goes to court, right? Yes, so right. What, what would be the bar the courts would use to? So I think the I think um, probably, and this is my best guess on what a court would do. Um, they would look to what the town expected to get out of the arrangement in the first place, and try to get a sense for whether making this assignment is going to markedly reduce the town's ability to get that benefit. Um, I think that's the analysis we would have to undergo in that circumstance. And if we can point to certain things that a few, uh, an assignee that the developer would be choosing at that point um, that would indicate that they're just not going to be able to do this, the things that we want them to do, that would rise to the level of a reasonable basis. Uh, so, 
looking specifically, so according to Mr. Bryn's analysis, the first one released, so the one on the <clears throat> that was released on September 19th, it looks like there is, I know these aren't single family homes, but there is the opportunity for a thousand new housing units on year one to five. So it looks to me at after year five, we could have a thousand new housing units and 1,300 total through the first 10 years. So working off that and the section 2.3C in the contract that essentially is the clause that says, hey, if they build more than 750 single family homes. So I guess question one would be, does that void the entire, the way I'm reading is that void, voids the entire language of the CEA. Uh, and question two would be, would that be when they, if, if it's not them, the a new developer would pull a 751st building permit. How is it quantified, according to the language, that we have exceeded the 750 single-family homes? Well, we've excluded uh, senior and affordable. Sure. But uh, the intent, and I believe the language serves that intent, uh, is that, uh, that the CEA ceases to exist if they... Uh, if they go beyond that cap or any successor goes and beyond that cap. Sure, so how would that happen? So when is that, is that something that it's constantly checked in on? Can you, can you get through 850 houses before, you know, like how would that, how, would, how do we know the 750 single family house threshold hasn't met? You're looking at what kind of audit are we gonna do? Right, yep. yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll set up an internal system that yeah. will we'll check that. Um, there's also biennial reporting, so I suspect as part of that, there'll be a, a check-in with the public on a fairly consistent basis. And if we're ever getting close to that, we're going to watch it really, really closely. So I, I don't fear So it'd be more ability. frequently than biannually? Certainly. We'll, yeah. We have systems in place to monitor all sorts of things on a daily basis. So sure. I have no doubt in our abilities to monitor that piece. And I know we're, we're trying to understand, uh, you know, and study the problem statement, not necessarily jump into solutions. But I did miss the opportunity to respond to the point you made there about the triggers, you know, and the, the commitment to meet every year to discuss progress, mm -hmm. you know, with the developers. Why couldn't we have as part of that meeting spell out that that would be a, a checkpoint of all key metrics, including uh, residential units built against the 750, um, infrastructure um, in the ground or meters of sewer pipe or whatever the measures should be. Um, versus the total, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So at least we've got a dashboard. I, I, I know you, you're considering those for the Finance Committee dashboards to kind of let us know if we're red, yellow, green, and trending. Why couldn't we do something like that so that we would have a, a, a running idea of the trajectory of this thing? That was clearly my expectation of what those biannual reports would be. Uh, we didn't articulate you know, all the metrics we yeah. want to measure. Yeah. We haven't done uh, that before. But I, I think that's a reasonable expectation that the council is going to be very interested in the particulars of what's going on out there and you know what's planned for the future as well. But, but I would like to see, since we're at the point of trying to consider uh, agreements that are drafted and proposed in front of us, that that would be put in now so that we don't leave that for a future date and never get to it. So that, that would be my bias since we're, and I don't, you know, I, I don't really know what the material standard is for this, but uh, we know we got a lot of smart people Police are being focused on this, uh, and um, it seems like it would be that would be something that we could work on to reassure the public that hey, we have these safeguards or this process built in. So this is how we're going to track it. And a, and a quick question on, on just that last point. I think I'll, I'll turn to Shana. It, it, as I understand it, once the CEA is approved, then it's hard to any amendments after that. We do want to make changes has to be mutually agreed upon, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, that's that's certainly true. And in fact, in this scenario, because um, the development program and, and adoption of the TIF district is um, subject to the statutory process, depending on what kind of amendments we're talking about, um, we might have to go back through the public hearing mm -hmm. process to to make certain modifications that are large enough in scope. And that really just hardwires in the, the public notice, public hearing process yeah. and um, authorization. So it's, so it's only a consideration of if it's better to do it now than to try to do it downstream to make adjustments um, in the CEA. Well, 
Um, I think it's nice to avoid having to do amendments. I will offer, though, that I do about I do a lot of TIF work, and about half of what I do are amendments <laughs> to TIFs and CDAs, and half of what I do are new. Yeah. So um, it's it's frequent that you know things evolve, and um, and you may want to amend your TIF district for purposes other than the, those that relate to the credit enhancement agreement. But but it wouldn't be the total control of the town council. It would have to be mutually agreed upon, which which creates. With the yes, yeah. as a contract, yes. Just wanted to make sure. I think, Sean, you had a question. Well, so the question I have is um, maybe to the bigger scale of what was asked regarding um, kind of like uh, individual solutions. Is it common to put that level of detailed solution within a contract? Because it seems to me there's there are so many variables. Um, by the way, no matter what detail that you put in, the second part of the question is um, in 20 years, presumably all of us are gone. I know some of us will be. Um, it, and the next council or that council gone, can change gone, it completely. Like gone, gone? Well, well, you know what I mean. You're not going to be sitting at the table. <laughs> he meant retired. Yeah, retired, that's right. Good. No. <laughs> um, I mean, they can change it, right? Like, any future council can change it both to be uh, more restrictive as well as more generous. So long as if it's um, changes to the credit enhancement agreement, the developer right. uh, agrees to that. That's that but, is. But to this point, expectations of future counselors we can't anticipate. I mean, right. we can, I guess, put a stake in the ground to say these are the things we think at the outset are important mm -hmm. to check on a periodic basis. Um, I, I think what you're talking about here is probably something that's quite achievable. I don't think conceptually it's oppo opposed yeah. to this um, in concept. Yeah, I mean, what I was trying to do is kind of address a question I think Sean asked last time. For the TIF overall, right? we can make amendments as a town council to the TIF overall. Mm -hmm. um, so we can change the percentage we withhold. We can change okay. on how the funds are going to be used. Right. But right. once we have the document that's the CEA, then there has to be that mutual consent. Okay. It's a contract. Mm -hmm. only, only those items that are in the CEA. For anything else related to the TIF district, right, it right. doesn't affect that right. obligation. Right, in right. But, but, but exactly. there's two two distinct sort of conversations. The that's bigger TIF, absolutely, we can as a this council or future council, whatever, that's within their preview. Yep. But for the credit enhancement, we ha once we sign it, then it, it it's, it's a two party conversation. That's correct. So, so the first part of the question was about the level of detail because yeah. there's big scope issues I don't disagree with that should be in a CEA that agree upon, but the level of detail seems to be more about managing, managing the contract, mm -hmm. at least in that one particular. Is that common to include the language? It seems to me that um, it might not. I would say it's not common. Uh, you know that this this particular credit enhancement agreement, given the level of performance standards that are included. There's a lot more detail. Um, I think there needs to be because the town has, has said we need to have these performance standards in place, and that then created the need for us to figure out how to, mm -hmm. our, to the best of our ability, measure that in the okay. future and create a process. So I would say there's a lot more detail already in this credit <coughs> agreement than I see normally. Um, but it is what it is. It's a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, we put in the level of detail we feel we need. I think thinking about, you know, uh, staying on top of it as the first several years come along particularly is an excellent thought. I mean, we really, but I think the town has the control over most of the data that would ever, building permits, uh, tax uh, values, uh, a lot of the data would be in our hands and producible. And if we were to make a request for data that was not confidential data, I have no doubt that since this has an element of partnership, by contract, but partnership, that uh, anything we requested that was exclusively in the hands of the developer, and. Who's to say what that might be? Which is why I wouldn't necessarily go down the road of trying to say, now we're going to have seven subparagraphs that identify it because when we're not at the table, somebody else might have a different perception. Uh, but I think all of the data is, is largely within our control or <coughs> would always be willingly produced by the partner that we're establishing in this agreement. 
Just another point. That, keep in mind, it doesn't mention anywhere in here, but there's the whole planning board process and the rigors right. associated with that. And this zone in particular requires some extraordinary time um, in terms of initial planning. So there's a lot of lead time. There'll be things that are in front of planning board, like they are now, that are six, eight, 12 months, um, you know, from coming to reality. What we do know already is the first phase is approved and it's all residential predominantly anyway. The second phase is, um, is in process, uh, but that is a, a total flip in, in terms of it's all light industrial and manufacturing focused. So that much we know, uh, there'll be phases three, four, and five and beyond perhaps. And so there'll be a sense of what's kind of in the works as well while we're actually seeing dirt moving down there. I have no doubt that we have control of, of that data today. The worry that I have is scope and scale and how the current system will be tested. I think the developers would even tell you now that we're bursting at the seams in terms of agendas for the planning board. People are maxed out in terms of just the work they've done to support the proposal phase of the downs. Um, you know, and I look at some data here from 2017 of the list of all the tips in, this, in the state of Maine. There's about 50 of them. Uh, ours would be number three on the list behind um, Bath Ironworks, which was never really listed. It was, it was whittled down. Hollis is number two at 109 um, million. Um, and that's because they had to create an entire town infrastructure, Poland Spring Water did, mm -hmm. because they had no public safety function. And Rumford, I think, was probably related to a paper mill there. But ours would be in the top three of that, which would suggest that we are, uh, you know, a big gorilla uh, in the TIF and CEA world. So we ought to have big gorilla infrastructure uh, to be able to manage it. And I, I think even today, with the volume of growth that we have, you, know, you look at the building permit process, pick one. And I'm not saying this to, to be critical. I'm saying this to be uh, factual and realistic about the load factor. If we're looking at this, you know, Size and scale, 80 million, 30 years, it's going to take a different level of effort, resources, and support in order to really manage that effectively. Why don't we begin by making sure that we've got documents that are going to make that possible, not something we'll figure out you know, later? Because you know, I find there, there'll be lots of other things for us to be worrying about later. So that's the, I, and I think every time we get into talking about the downs, we skip over the fact that this is an enormous undertaking. Um, and that we, we tend to compare it to all the other TIFs and CEAs, which it really is, is not like all the other ones. It's, a, it's certainly an enormous undertaking, no question, but I, I, I would also say it's, a, it's an enormous opportunity, and it's an opportunity for us to, to, to take an active role in development more so than we can in other circumstances. Uh, in all other circumstances, we've set the zoning, the land use regulations say what they can and can't do, uh, we've got some other mechanisms that might throttle things through the growth control. But beyond that, we take what comes our way, what we say is permitted. This allows us to take an active role, and that's a unique and different um, level of involvement, and, and there's a level of effort and responsibility that comes with that. There's no question. Go ahead. Um, I, I want to kind of take us out of the weeds a little bit because I think we're diving in pretty deep and go back to that 50,000 foot view because that's where I live. <laughs> um, and for me, and this kind of goes back to, or to address your first question or concern uh, in talking around, uh, you know, worst case scenario, best case scenario, I think we could walk down the street and poll uh, our citizens and um, we'd get a whole lot of opinions about what the worst case scenario and the best case scenario is. Some would say the best case scenario is that um, the Rocky uh, brothers all go on vacation, never come back, and don't build anything there. And then we would have some other folks in town who would say, um, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I can't wait for a community center. I've been asking for a pool for a long time. So for me, what I, when I look at that, I, I try to weigh all of that. It's been pretty even, honestly, the feedback that we've been getting um, via email and conversations. But I look at it as, so I, I live over that way. I, I used to cut through that road. I can't anymore. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was driving by a, a, you know, a business that at one, one time was thriving and a crown jewel for the town that was no longer that and could be, again, um, some dilapidated buildings and, and whatnot. And so when I think about 
best case and worst case scenario for me, it's going to land, something's going to happen there. <laughs> so uh, I want the best partner, uh, and I do think we have the best partner right now, um, and I want the best mix possible because I think that's, uh, to go back to our biggest goal around keeping taxes predictable and sustainable, um, for me, worst case scenario would be we're not at the table, and we don't have a say in the mix, and I think 40% residential would crush us. Um, I've not run the numbers because I'm not that girl, um, but I've seen them enough at a high, a high enough level that uh, I don't believe that would best serve our town either. So I'm not in the camp of this is the best thing since sliced bread, and I certainly think there could be potentially some language changes, and I'm curious to hear um, more about what some of the things are that you may have. Um, because I think, as Bill said, fresh eyes on a, a project that you've been looking at for a long time is really helpful. Um, and I'm sure you found some things that we didn't even consider or talk about yet. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where I am on, on the big, higher picture piece. I think we could get too far in the weeds, too, trying to worry about um, what are every scenario. So they go in through phase one, and they lose all their money and they're bankrupt, so now we have just a small little residential pod and a huge green space that could become a park or something. I don't know. Um, but I, I think that's almost getting too far ahead of ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> Steve, could you expand on, in your, your executive summary here, you cl pretty clearly say that you have a little bit of reservations about the retail sector. Um, not A, for the demand of the retail sector, and B, how it would actually fit into a vision of downtown. Um, so if it, if it were successful, um, that it might not actually reconcile with the vision of a walkable downtown. Um, I didn't know if maybe you could expand on that. And after, on, on a second follow-up point, if I'm reading this correctly, we're also looking at the same student load, if not smaller student load, for scenario number one without the CEA. So if you could maybe educate me on those two, that would be helpful. Sure. Be happy to try. Um, <laughs> yeah, <seconds>. so so, <laughs> so on, on the uh, well, let me start with the second question. Sure. So, yeah, the student load is dependent on the type of housing being built. Right. And so, in, in scenario one, um, there are fewer, um, there are more total housing being built, 1986, I believe versus a thousand and some change in scenario two, but the number of students resulting out of those is only about 50 different because of the type of housing that's put into the model. Um, one point I tried to make in the, in the study was that if there's really demand in Scarborough for that, for 350 students and it, that are gonna arise out of, out of scenario uh, one, then they're probably going to show up somewhere else in town anyway. Right. So it, it could be academic. So scenario two could have result with 350 students too. They just won't be in that development necessarily. Um, so is that? Yep. That's, yeah. I just want to make sure I was reading it. I was. Yep. And then um, just refresh. The. Uh, one of the biggest concerns I think you had because oh. it was quite a bit of extrapolation. Right. Right. On the retail. Yeah. 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 So, so the models that the consultants did to evaluate the demand for retail basically showed not a lot of demand in Scarborough for additional retail. Um, and I, I think it was an appropriate analysis, but what it didn't consider really is, is the type of unique retail that might fit in that location. My experience, I think the type of location that we're looking at would support certain types of retail that don't exist in this part of the market. And by market, I mean the greater Scarborough market, sure. yep. which includes you know, seven or eight towns. Um, so I think those types of retailers would find the site attractive. Do you have an example of those types of retailers? Well, I'm sure it could be something like uh, a, a unique type of soup market that isn't in the market yet, or it could be uh, a wholesale type of club that isn't in the market yet. Um, those type of retailers, I think, would find this site very attractive. Um, 
because they're able to draw customers past more conventional, convenience-oriented retailers, where other, you know, if you put a, not to pick on Shaw's, but I always, I always pick on Shaw's. But, um, it's your hand for habits. We do work. If you put a Shaw's in this development, they may not be able to do enough volume, or even a Hannaford for that matter, because people aren't going to drive by more convenient Shaw's to get to this one. And, and there's not enough uh, population base within the development to support a, a store itself. It has to draw people from outside. So, so the Cabela's gateway model. Yes, exactly. It has to be more of a regional drawer, and, and, the, and the regional access is excellent for this site. So my, my concern that I mentioned in the report was if it's going to have a regional drawer and, and, and attract a, a large number of customers, it could threaten the pedestrian friendliness of the, of the housing development. So I, my, my concern and recommendation was that, and in, in subsequently I think I saw a plan that showed that they're, they're separated enough so that that shouldn't be an issue, that people feel comfortable living in, in, in a residential part of the development, not really be impacted by the retail development, um, and, and be able to do their uh, downtown pedestrian walking, and, and, and really, it shouldn't be an issue, but I think it, I, potentially it could be if it wasn't designed appropriately. Does that, that help you? Yeah, very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to uh, suggest, um, I think that Councilor Foley brought up a good point about the risk. If you talk to the general public in Scarborough, the risk that they're focusing in on is not related to the credit enhancement agreement or the TIF. Uh -huh. What they're focusing on is what is going to be developed there. And everything that's currently being proposed, which is outside of both of these, um, is permissible under ex existing zoning and ordinance. They're worried about the type of housing, what's the industries, um, how many kids are going to be as a result of that. I think in the worst case scenario, at least for me, is what if we don't do this and we have 4,000 residential homes, that is the bigger risk uh, of what, you know, from the what if. But I think that Katie was 100% right. They're focusing on something very different than what the actual impact of this credit enhancement agreement or the TIF is. Uh, because uh, I did hear, for, uh, actually it was from Mr. Hamill's wife, I think is the one that asked the question early on. The, the risk is, why do we need to give $81 million for development that could already happen um, without it? Um, I have an opinion on that, but I think that's, that was probably the only one that I heard that was related to the actual agreement. Yeah, I, I, I've always thought that there were, I mean, two premier reasons to do it. One, if we could, in the end, have make a lot of money for the town out of this. And the model had to show it, and we had to have it tested. Uh, but secondly, money isn't the only driving factor here. Mm. The point that's being made is, is it going to manage growth? Uh, because we've got a long time in place comprehensive plan that identifies this as the growth area for all the good planner speak reasons that uh, you uh, it's in the center of everything you can have limited uh, uh, transportation problems the cost of services are reduced so that's sort of baked into the cake and now what I've always thought we should be doing is, and I would, uh, from the beginning, once we had reached the agreement that we were going to limit this potential of thousands of residences to 750 single-family residences, which is where I've always perceived the school children really come from primarily, instead of one or two-bedroom apartments or senior housing, mm -hmm. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful step forward that the developers were prepared to make that commitment because that really, the factors were how do you drive the mix? Square footage of non-residential space, limit single family, uh, uh, large three and four bedroom 
3,000 square foot, three bathroom, four bathroom houses, that we have, I don't know, we have seven or 10,000 of them in town. It's 77% uh, single family dwellings. And that's a, that's a killer. You can't, we've had a long standing goal of getting a residential mix of 75% residential, 25% non residential, commercial, industrial, manufacturing, retail. Well, I th I've been enthused by our willing the willingness of the developer to negotiate towards that. And it's funny, the first time we ever met, I remember Peter Michaud making the point. This could be something special for Scarborough. It was remarkable. They had, they came to the table with the vision that that we could manage growth in a way that would improve the tax base uh, tremendously. And I've always thought that managing growth was, if we can do that and make money, we really <coughs> will have. Uh, you know, I'd love it to be a beautiful downtown and a park and a community center, and we'll work on those in the next five years. But the hard, the hard fact was control growth, have it be a good financial, fiscal uh, uh, outcome for the town. And maybe I can digress a little bit. And Steve, while you're here, just to kind of put you on the spot, because I think we've heard tonight a couple times, and I agree, the making money part is key. And Steve, you, in your report, and actually we haven't really talked about it as a group, the two financial reports we got. So in yours, I just like, there, there are a couple things you did say that I'd just like to have you talk a little bit about, about impact. And, and one is, you talked a little, we talked about earlier tonight, the capital cost. Yeah. So what you have in here on page two of your report, you have, it is assumed that the current and future impact fees will cover the cost of any future infrastructure need cost specifically by this development that was not already being paid for by the developer directly. Evaluating impact fees was beyond the scope of, of the assignment. So, so clearly you've kind of said that's an important assumption. Right. And then we don't have, and Tom, maybe before I digress, can you talk, Steve's here, but the other consultant we had, do you want to talk a little bit about who that was and a little bit of background, which is... Um, sure, he's pro provided a bit of a, a bio yeah. about yeah. himself in the, yeah. in the materials that are posted. Uh, He's a consultant that we actually uh, had association with as part of our comprehensive plan process. And we've actually purchased the so-called ROI model that um, relied heavily on understanding and estimating costs of different development types as part of our comprehensive plan um, as a planning tool, really uh, evaluating land use decisions uh, and being more informed about what, what's the impact and consequence of this zone over that zone. We use this, uh, the model that he uh, created for that planning purpose uh, for a very <coughs> detailed analysis of a particular set of development scenarios. So Steve, you, you sort of recognize or question sort of that cost of capital or infrastructure. He also points out, Matt, this other consultant mm -hmm. said that the fiscal impact analysis excludes construction costs from the calculations based on the assumptions that all in infrastructure <coughs> will be paid by the developer and are with current uh, future development impact fees. Evaluating the, t the <coughs> town's development impact fee program and calculating if impact fees might cover all future infrastructure costs not paid by the developer is beyond the scope of the peer review. So, so both are saying that's a critical assumption. So that's one question I had, so if you could speak to that. Two, you also point out, um, and I, I just want more clarity, it's um, it is worth noting that the 336 million in scenario one and the 117 million in scenario two are provided in future dollars and would be considerably less in today's dollars if the discount rate was applied. So that that's really has something to do with, with the, the timing of revenue flows and we would get them. That really ties into the third piece that, I, that, that, that really is my bigger question. Um, it, it, one, I guess the, the fourth thing is you, you kind of get this disclaimer, it would be prudent for the town to also have an outside person who demonstrated expertise in municipal and school development costs and revenues, review the assumptions. And your last bullet is, additionally, the, both scenarios have, in, in this case, 78% of our revenues, the town revenue, occur in years 20 through 30. 
and you said Shay, you, you say there should be there's a significant amount of risk that's sort of associated with that. <clears throat> um, that's echoed by again this consultant that says. Um, uh, where is it? Um, it says, you know, again, the 30-year build-up period for the physical impact analysis is longer than similar studies in the United States. Changing market conditions, demographics, lifestyle choices, et cetera, observed over the last 30 years demonstrate how variable some of the assumptions about household size, students per household, might be anticipating conditions for 2048. So can you weave those themes together, and we're talking a lot tonight about risk. Mm -hmm. Is there some risk that most of our revenue comes in years 20 through 30 in this in this forecast? Well, and yeah, is I, there any way to address that in, in your estimation? I, I think there is risk in, in that assumption. Um, I'd, li I'd like to see, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, development occur earlier than years 20 to 30, because as, as you just mentioned, you know, it, it's hard to predict what's going to what's going to change between now and then. Um, whereas in the years zero through ten, you know, it's 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 fairly predictable. Um, once you get beyond year ten, you're going into another level of unknown and a, a more of a level of high level of risk. But um, so I, I would like to. If it were my project, I would, I would like to see, you know, maybe 50-50, say 50% of the uh, uh, of the revenues occur after year 20, as opposed to 80%, 77 or in scenario one, it's 62%. So in the preferred scenario, it's, it's 62%. That's close to the 50. -50. So in my mind, the CEA scenario is less risky than doing nothing because. That revenue is really backloaded. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's based on assumptions that, that the developer has given Karen that says, that says you know, X amount of development is going to happen in, in each year, and, and a lot of it's going to happen after year 20. Um, and, and do you have a rule of thumb that if you, have, if you brought dollars from year 20 and 30 back to present tense, yeah. that, that's a significant yeah. I, reduction? Yeah, I'd say. Of course, it depends on, on your discount rate and, uh -huh. and what what percentage you think inflation is going to be in the next 30 years. But if you used a 0.4 uh -huh. to multiply, you know, the 386 million, if that's the right number, I think, you know, that's probably bringing it back to today. Yeah. Ballpark. Multiply so, by 0. 0. 0. 0.4. So 130 million. Today. Um, <coughs> but. If you're comparing scenario one to scenario two, it's, it's still going to be the same relative difference. You know, if you're talking about today's dollars, you're talking about dollars out in year 30. It's the, the relative magnitude between the two scenarios isn't going to be dramatically different. Um, so. I, just, I just remember when we were when we were working together at Hannaford, I know all the investments we did, it was 10 years, right? We looked at 10 years because Well, we looked at 10 years, and then we looked at another 10 years that basically we said the first 10 years we're going to make real assumptions about what's going to happen, and the next 10 years we're going to let it ride, and then we bring it all back to year zero. Right. Uh, and Peter, if I could just add to it, because you've made, um, you, you talked before about the, um, you know, um, what's going to happen in the early years because that's more predictable. And so one of the, there's a couple of things. One, I think that's why scenario um, one, which is the preferred one, um, the manufacturing, the production um, uh, square footage is really front-loaded on that one because they know the market is now. And so that is one of the fundamental differences between um, Scenario one and scenario two is they're trying to get most of that done in the first um, five to ten years. How much, so, foot, how much square footage are we assuming by year ten? And that it's not a five hundred thousand square feet. Under, under, that's that's a measure. Right, right, that's a measure. It's a little bit more than that from the um, <laughs> just from that's, the numbers your, that they've given me. That's year ten, right? It's ten years out. Yeah. Well, some of it is happening happening so, early. It's it's why they were. Um, mm -hmm. concerned about uh, taking time because they do have some folks who are ready to go in the spring. Um, 
I don't know if Rocky is. Yeah. Behind you, Rocky wanted to contribute. Sure. Sure. So, Let's take the podium, sure. please. Yes, yes. <laughs> Where do you look? To insert black one. Uh, just to clarify those numbers again, the credit enhancement agreement um, is 500000 We have to be at by year five. Ten. Um, ten. Year ten. Under construction. Under ten. Not, con not completed, just under construction, right? Under construction or, or permitted uh, and going uh, by year ten. Um, but in our light uh, manufacturing and, and uh, innovation district, that area is planned for. Uh, 750,000 square feet of manufacturing, and then there's another about 180,000 square feet of more of a retail type uh, use. So we're in the process of getting that section approved right now. But that's still after year 10, right? But what you just described? It's in the numbers as if it were going to occur after year 10, but we're trying to get it approved now because we know there's a market for it now. Hey, quick, quick, quick question to Thomas and Claire. When you mm -hmm. said you're both both teams are working on the cost of infrastructure. I think you said by, you know, you're working on that now. Is that going to be broken out between what is the infrastructure cost for residential versus what the infrastructure cost is for light industrial and the other? Is there a way to break that out or have I, some I haven't seen how granular their, their information is. I think it's going to be difficult to assign infrastructure costs entirely to one use or another because, you know, it's, there's enabling infrastructure that's necessary that's going to kind of run up to the middle of the site and then feed the different areas. But I thought when we were talking today, you said something about we know it's it's higher voltage stuff, bigger diameter pipes. But I mean, if, if there's any way to tease that out, I think that'd be really helpful for us to see what's what's the residential infrastructure, what's sort of the... Uh, I see what you mean. I, yeah, there's... It, this is not my area of expertise, but there's certain infrastructure that that is unique to certain development types. Uh, Three-phase uh, electricity is not likely, they wouldn't make the investment but for the mm -hmm. need of the industrial customers. Uh, sizing of some of the systems, uh, the water flow and sewer flow, uh, will be in large part predicated on who the users are. So there is an incremental, there's a, there's a cost difference depending on those users. Yeah, it, it'd just be helpful if there was some way to Try to ballpark the total infrastructure cost and, and what what sort of how those numbers break up. Before we leave, Steve, I just want to point out um, one thing that I was struck with with uh, on this major theme is that you say if phases one and two get built as proposed in years zero through ten, and that they're doing well, the likelihood is good that phases phase three will also be built. Right. So. Another way of saying that, are you saying if the best way to assure future success is do what we can to get near-term success? Is that yes. fair? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think I think the risk is, is reduced if, if phases one and two and whatever else happens in the first ten years is successful. The, the out years have a high likelihood of being successful as well. Thank you. Just, just want to, Steve. I don't know if you know. This is an additional cost. We we're talking about um, the mat use for schools. Um, the unit costs and new unit values used for the fiscal impact analysis of consistent stands on the, the two perspectives of school costs provide a more conservative, including certain fixed costs, and less conservative, excluding fixed costs. We excluded fixed costs. Do you know what Matt was referring to there? I can help on that. We, we, we did both. We looked at um, uh, just the average cost, the 15000 plus per student, and then we did um, what we called the sort of marginal cost analysis, which was um, looking at probably not going to double the central office, so we took some key costs out, and that was about 30%, I believe. And so we ran both analysis, so we had a low end and a high end on the analysis for for schools. So we looked at it both ways. So did, was he just, did he just get confused about saying that it, it, it he's saying that we excluded the, the fixed costs. I'll, I'll in, one, in one scenario we did, yes. And in, we, we looked at it both ways. And, um, and in both ways, I'll say in the, the first five years, you're certainly better off if you're using the 70% um, um, or 
30% fixed, 70% assigned to the um, students, but we wind up being positive um, in terms of the um, ROI in both cases. Um, so we, we, did, we did run the full freight, I think it's 15-2, something like that. Um, so in both cases, we're positive. I think Matt was saying that to be entirely conservative in the cost analysis, mm -hmm. use the higher number. Right. Um, I think we did a very thoughtful uh, review of our costs and extracted out those ones that we don't think will be duplicated. Uh, that ends up being assigning a unit cost per student in the order of ten thousand uh, dollars per head, as opposed to the full freight of fifteen. If you simply do the math of student population into the total cost of schools, uh, that's the per, per pupil expense. Uh, if Karen, if I could ask this of you, uh, when we had our public hearing, what we were hearing from the business community, Scarborough Chamber of Commerce, Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce, was that they said go report, uh, that they were endorsing the uh, adoption of this TIF and CA <coughs> because they saw a large economic development element. We haven't really talked about the economic mm -hmm. development. Did you sort of run a, a, a deal, no deal comparison to see how good the economic development mm -hmm. is in doing this deal? We did look at um, jobs in both cases, um, and we looked at um, the jobs that would be created on the um, site. And for the, um, forgive me, I'm not going to remember the scenario one, but I believe for scenario, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> scenario two, but for scenario one, we were somewhere around um, 2,500 jobs to almost 3,000. And um, the difference is really office um, in terms of the square feet <coughs> per employee. If you're looking at sort of the IDEX version of um, employees per square feet, that's very low, like <coughs> under 200 square feet per employee, we were being conservative and using a higher factor. And that's where that 2,400 uh, came in. I think on the scenario two, we were down to um, really about 1,000 um, new jobs over the course of the 30 years. Um, the other thing that we, we didn't really... Scenario uh, two I'm the, sorry. is lesser. The lesser scenario. And that is... A do no deal correct. scenario. And, correct. Okay. Correct. And then the um, types of things that we um, didn't look at is the spin-off effect of um, really having this development build out. Um, I will tell you, we were, all, we were already seeing people more interested in what's happening in Hygus Parkway because they, they believe something's going to be happening at the Downs. So there's, some, there's definitely some activity there. And I think that um, will begin to spur more interest in Hygus. It will also be I think one of the things that the Chamber is very interested in. When you land at this amount of both employees and um, population, you're going to have some uh, great customers for all of your Oak Hill businesses, um, for restaurants, shopping, and those types of things. So I think that's where the uh, Chamber of Commerce folks really come in, as they see this as there's a lot of new customers coming to town. Thank you. Can I ask a question of Rocky? Would that be okay? Or is that inappropriate? You can kind of ask a question of Rocky come up. And okay, sure. So I think because the agreement, the way the agreement's worded, because our check-in is at 10 years, I didn't know if perhaps it would be useful to maybe, I know nobody's being held to any of these numbers, but maybe give a snapshot of what year five would look like. Um, because, every, because 10 years is 10 years in the future, um, and then we do, we are up against that 70, approximately 70% 70 of our benefit is past that 10 years in the future. So I didn't know if it was possible to articulate what five years could look like, what five years is going to look like, best case scenario, just. Where do you want to be in five years? Yeah, where do you want to be in five years? <laughs> yeah. uh, we want to be uh, on the downside of finishing up the, the light industrial phase. Uh, which would mean that we're, you know, over half a million in uh, on, on uh, square footage. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, we, we agree with Mr. Brin. We, we want to develop this thing faster uh, 
uh, if possible. We do feel this market available to us now, um, and we think it's, it's very important um, that we get this agreement signed so that we can move forward. Um, we talked a little bit about data calls at the sales cycle, but it takes a lot of time in the, in the, in the uh, developing business and the construction business to the time we figure out what the plan is, we get it designed and drawn and get it approved and go find a buyer and then physically build the building and get the building occupied and get them paying taxes. You can go through three, four years pretty, yeah. pretty easily by the time you get there. So when you start to think about this 10-year, this five-year, this 10-year period, um, it, we're going to get there pretty pretty quickly. Our goal would to be would be to be well above the 500,000 at year 10, um, and, and we feel that it's absolutely possible uh, to do that. Um, but it's important to you know, to let us get started, and you know, we think that this uh, this light industrial phase is, is really the place to start. If I could, I, I did explore fairly thoroughly, I think, uh, the, the notion of an earlier checkpoint, a five-year checkpoint, sure. maybe model on the same kind of metric, some number of square footage for non-residential build-out, or we even talked about uh, maybe uh, a metric around infrastructure in the ground, which would be another indication of the correct direction. I had great receptivity from these guys that uh, we could do that. The hang-up is, what's the consequence of not? And the chilling effect that that consequence, because there, there could be a penalty, it's, it's a lesser reimbursement, so it's back to the, uh, the, the financial aspects of this, that puts a real chilling effect on their ability to go out now and secure the other resources uh, required to make this go forward. But there, there is nothing of that sort in the agreement now. There is no penalty, no downside penalty. It's only 40% and there is nothing of the sort in there now. So That's true. So true, I don't know. I, I, I understand how it could have a financial impact in terms of, well, the, if this is a condition and you're talking to a bank, then that collateral is not worth the same as it is now. Correct. Right? They're going to so, look at the lesser percentage. So I get say. that. However, we're looking out for the town's interests mm -hmm. uh, primarily. I understood. Uh, and, you know, we have partners and we want them to succeed, but our focus is first and foremost. The while, while Rocky's up there, Rocky, can you give us an idea of kind of what you're thinking will happen over the next 12, 24 months out there at the site? So the next 12 to 24 months, uh, as you all know, we've started phase one. Uh, infrastructure is going in the ground. I would like to point out that the infrastructure that's going in the ground, in the down road today, is designed to handle our master plan as we desire to build it out. We have a 16-inch water main where if all we were doing was phase one, we'd just put an 8-inch water main. We've got um, live sewer mains, we've got gas, uh, natural gas, we've got uh, three-phase power going in. We're building a 60-foot wide right away, 28-foot um, 20, uh, uh, wide road, bicycle lanes on both sides, sidewalk on one side, on-street parking. We're building a road system right from Route 1 to start that's designed to serve this entire project. It's not needed to serve phase one. Um, so that's 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 been in our design uh, from day one because we know where we really want to go. With. So we see uh, in the next 12 months, uh, 12 to 18 months, we should be uh, completed in phase one and fully sold out, fully occupied uh, on the apartments and, and the condominiums, um, as well as the memory care facility. Um, so we see that uh, going. We would like to be uh, building, uh, putting infrastructure in the ground and, uh, and building uh, commercial buildings, uh, light industrial buildings in, in what we want to be phase two. We have users uh, in line that would like to put a shovel in the ground in June. And we are doing everything we can right now to be able to meet that schedule. We do intend to make a DEP submission in December so that we can be in position to start in uh, June. So over that next time period, we would be, if we can get a credit enhancement agreement uh, signed and know that we can then get our funding in place and get the infrastructure in the ground, we'll be building that uh, light industrial phase. That's, that's where I see us. Thank you. Yeah, Jean Marie? Um, Rocky, while I have you up there, <laughs> through the chair. Um, can you talk a little bit, when you talk about infrastructure, of course, I'm back at talking, thinking about broadband and 
crew ring binder and whatever, and am I incorrect in assuming that you're going to be bringing all of that in through that whole area? Because I think that would be critical for your, not only for your light industrial manufacturing, but also people who live in those houses or apartments or Absolutely. whatever. That's that's all on, on the way. Okay, so you do plan to ex expand from the three ring binder, the high speed, the high high speed. Yes, we're working with them now. We're also working with Transit now. Okay. Uh, to okay. Get them, to get them lined up. And they're okay. very very interested in our in our project, and uh, I think the town's going to be happy to see. Well, I think we can achieve if we, if we work together uh, in that regard. I guess, Rocky, while you're there, I guess I'll recognize myself. Okay, just a, a quick question. Do you, you include it in the CA, and Tom, this may be a question for you mm -hmm. or, or Councilor Donovan. How does it address if they're non for profit, non taxable properties that go in? I mean, we all know that Maine Health is a huge property owner in Scarborough, but how does that count toward the totals? How does that count? I, are they implicitly included in the totals for square footage if, if entities come in that aren't going to be paying real estate taxes? Alyssa, jump in if I'm wrong, but, but my understanding is that the, the square footage of what gets built uh, to serve their needs does get counted towards our total of, of square footage uh, requirements. Uh, but if, they're, you know, if they don't pay taxes, we don't get any, any money. So no, no, neither do we, though. <laughs> you know, so neither do we. So it's, it's kind of a two-way street. But, but, it, but I think but, what Rocky's referring to is there's a benchmark of $615 million in increased taxable. assessed value okay. that, that has to be achieved. That's a taxable property, not a non-taxable property. So that if we had a big main med facility in there that was worth $50 million bucks, it would go on the rolls at zero for the purposes of the year 20 benchmark. But it would count, I, I think Rocky just said, but it would count toward square the square footage. footage. Square, square footage. footage. So, but, but so, not, but but not see, at year 20, he doesn't have just a square footage. It's he has an uh, increased yeah, assessed yeah. value, so which is... Yeah. No, I just want to get clarity. So, yeah. so that's, that's what you think... That, that's, that, that, that's, that's how currently how it's in the document. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But isn't that for the ten percent bonus? The ten percent bonus that those hurdles, those, yeah, those the value ones, metrics, right? Yeah, but you've identified a point, and there's could be dozens other ones that we haven't even identified. But those sorts of issues would be worked on, probably not by me, by someone sitting in my in my seat with my responsibilities. The manager is tasked with reporting to council and as to whether performance measures have met been met. That very scenario might be one that uh, we would need to work through. But but if it's not explicit in this agreement, then it's really hard sure to. I mean, so, so that's why I think it's important yep. that we just keep in mind that there's some things that are going to be difficult to clarify down the road. And if I was asked that same question, I would I would agree that uh, though it's not explicitly written, my position would be that it would, uh, as Rocky suggests. But that's not to say uh, someone else other than me or another. A developer would see it differently. So, mm -hmm. to the extent we can clarify that and yep. parties agree, we mm -hmm. should. Yep. Just a question. Good point. Anybody else have anything for Rocky at this no. point? No. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> I have any, <laughs> Anybody else have anything on this issue at this point in, I, the, in the workshop? One last oh. question. Sorry. Shauna, could you speak to, on a scale of standard to exotic, what, where this agreement falls? Um, I wouldn't use the word exotic. Okay. <laughs> um, standard to standard to non-standard. Right. No, I mean, I would say that it is it is certainly warranted for there to be a lot more going on in this credit enhancement agreement. This is uh, there are lots of area-wide TIF districts like this in that sense across the state, but this is a huge. Uh, a, obviously a huge by projected increase in assessed value, but it's also a wide array of developments that are, are likely, it's not just a single business park 
where you're targeting right. one set of, of uses. There's, there's a lot going on here. So I think it's warranted for, for there to be a lot going on. But there, they, this is a complicated credit enhancement agreement as far as they go. I happen to be familiar with the BIW district that's referenced there. It's also very complicated. It is also very old, so it's even, mm. even worse. Um, mm. Old so, and complicated sounds bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, hey. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Yeah. just offended yeah. half the yeah. table. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think I think it is often the case that I tr I try to advise municipalities to keep things as simple as possible because someone in the future is going to have to interpret it. There's something that's going to come up, and um, sometimes that's not achievable um, in the in the truest sense of the word simple. Um, you know, we're trying to get something done here in the parties in order to get to an agreement. Um, there needs to be some, some complexity to it. And I, I would put this in that category. Um, so uh, I don't know for, what, for the, what that's worth. No, it's helpful. Thank you. Can, can I just ask a follow-up to that? Um, if, as I'm combing through the TIF and the CEA, there's stuff in one and not in the other, or when it's in the other one, it's not in exactly the same place, and, oh, by the way, some stuff's not in either one. So can you help to describe why, why is that, why one, one differs so dramatically in terms of format and content of the other? That, I'd be happy to. So, so there's two documents we're talking about. One is called the development program, and that's the required document under the TIF statute that establishes the TIF district, lays out a lot of the statutory criteria information, um, and um, and then separate, there's the credit enhancement agreement, which is actually the contract. That's the document that gives the developer the, the right to um, property tax reimbursement um, and lays out the conditions for those. So one simple explanation is that what's in the credit enhancement agreement is going to govern the relationship between the private party and the municipality going forward. What's in the development program is meant to provide a summary of information about the whole district's purpose and uses for future TIF revenue, including, in this case, a, a, frankly, a fairly thorough description of what the terms of that credit enhancement agreement would be. Um, there are other development programs in the state where um, it's, it's a lot more generic in terms of that description. It'll just say, you know, the, the council will authorize a credit enhancement agreement on a, on a very, you know, some basic terms. Well, there's so much going on in this agreement that I felt it was appropriate to put some additional um, background about what those um, terms are. But the contractual relationship will be governed <coughs> by the credit enhancement okay. agreement. So that was one other question. So I, the number of 3,100 jobs stuck in my, in my brain from the TIF, 3,100 jobs created potentially. Uh, and there's no mention of that at all in the CEA. That number does not appear in the CEA. And what's more concerning to me as an old HR guy is that there's no mention of how those things should be built. How do we build up to that number? And what's the process that we use to follow that? So that's even more, you know, that's even, if it's possible, more blank than some of the other things that I, that uh, we talked about earlier. So, the, you know, these are, you know, where are the reasons in the cake here? Okay. And I couldn't find that one. You know, one comment I would make about the jobs uh, question is um, um, a lot of the performance metrics in the credit enhancement agreement relate to things that the town has some information about already and, and can um, create, uh, can, can measure it itself. Um, I've been involved with credit enhancement agreements where the municipality really wanted to have jobs be a metric, and it, it ended up being much more difficult mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis to, to figure out mm -hmm. if those metrics were met, simply because you you, in, you have to rely upon some private party to, yep. to tell you how many people they employ. Yep. And sometimes getting that information can be tough, but that information is only so reliable. Um, I, I just offer that. I don't re recall whether, you know, we, what thought process went into that, but that's, that would have been my response. Um, in that. We, we could have chosen uh, establishing performance metrics around jobs. Uh, it's not to say we don't think that's important. We, we chose to, to focus uh, performance in different areas rather than job creation. Okay. 
I, I did want to mention, so Don, to your point, I believe that in the Cabela's, um, whatever, I can't remember the formal name of that credit enhancement agreement, there was a jobs metrics. Um, and in fact, uh, the criticism of having, not necessarily having that, but actually expecting them to report on it was Cabela's came in, promised a lot of full-time jobs, a different kind of retail, yep. um, uh, provided them within maybe the first five mm -hmm. years, and then all of a sudden they went to part-time. Mm -hmm. So instead of having full-time, they went to part-time. So it was one of those promises that were made at the beginning that um, never came to fruition, or they did for a short period of time, and then they realigned their model to exactly what they wanted. I think the jobs metric would be exceedingly difficult given the circumstance here. Uh, let's use mm. the Amazon example. Yep. Uh, I think. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Uh, we should put this conversation in context. Had Amazon come here, we'd be talking about a three billion dollar. So that photo off about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but because these folks aren't necessarily some of the buildings they'll own and manage in the future, but in large part, um, it's going to be hard to hold them accountable for job creation uh, when they're the, not the ones actually, you know, it's not a single business that has pretty good certainty around what they do and what the impacts of that are. Uh, so I think it would be an exceedingly difficult measure to, to use in this circumstance. Yeah, I could see how it'd be very hard to, to oh. control that, to manage it. Well, you can always double economic development groups so that they can bring in analysts to collect the data. Right, Karen? Right, sure. <laughs> Did those Squirt numbers come from Jim DeMesis? The jobs, um, no. actually both uh, Jim developed some and I developed some and they wound up being almost exactly okay. the, the same, are uh, very close to it. <clears throat> so these are mine. So going once, going twice, anybody, anything else? Everybody good? Um, I think at this point, if there's anybody from the audience that wants to talk about anything we've talked about tonight, welcome to the if anybody wants to go to the podium. Um, not seeing a lot of takers, so <laughs> um, I'll take just a brief moment. We're going to go back to the table, but I, I just thought this might be an opportunity as we are looking at, it's the time for committees and liaisons and just pass this sheet out. Tom, I think we may try to do something electronically for them to sign up. Do you think? Yeah, you I'll, just I'll see if we can send a Google Doc out so you, document so you can um, report online as opposed to so do it by hand, too, if that's what you need. So I think the intent here is maybe just to take a look at the and kind of indicate back what you might be interested in serving on. What we try to do here is the standing committees, how many members, and then the liaison committees. Um, so just let us know what you would like to participate in, and we will go about trying to make those assignments and other things, and be glad to answer any questions. We'd be glad to answer any questions. Just if I could, there was two things that I was taking notes here that, um, that I'd like to see if we can advance. Uh, one would be just further detail around the biennial reporting, um, and that's, this is all subject to the, the other party um, being agreeable. Uh, and the other one is maybe just some clarity around the tax exam question as to how that will be valued um, and counted going forward. Again, subject to um, verification. But those are the only two things that I identified as the conversation went on. I want to make sure I wasn't missing something else. Uh, as to the latter one, there didn't seem to be any disagreement uh, uh, about our interpretation versus uh, Scarborough Downs interpretation. So clarifying it, I think, which was Peter's point, better to do it now than when there are different people at the table. So I'd favor a clarification aspect there. So and I guess the question to Shauna would be, based on those two <coughs> clarifications, would that necessitate, uh, is that a or either one or both su substantive change such that we would need to restart uh, the, the process in your view? No, I mean, particularly because the the summary that's contained in the development program about the terms um, in the credit enhancement agreement don't relate to those two details. So I'm, I think if, if we were able to negotiate revisions that, that take up those two points, we could um, just make um, the updated credit enhancement agreement available to the public for the 28th and not have to read, read public notice for a public hearing under the TIPS tax. Yeah, and I kind of thought we were we were we we're going to leave this session to go into executive session. I think that's probably a good conversation to have there. I, I don't know if there's other conversations, so I think that's. I, I wasn't sure whether you were I, going I, to go to executive session. Oh, okay. I think yeah. it's scheduled. I think we should. It, it may be brief, but I think I think we should. For what purpose? 
Uh, I have about 25 other questions I didn't get a chance to ask, ask for one. I mean, I think that, and I don't know that uh, the characterization of uh, consensus and we're all good except for two things, uh, I would agree with it. So. Well, that's why so, I was checking it. Yeah, yeah. So, that's why I didn't. But I, I just want to make sure that um, the purpose of executive session right. is to ask questions that are strategic in nature that might compromise or uh, put into um, some risk that the contract that needs to be kept confidential. So if the questions... Well, it's negotiation strategy, too. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, I just so want to make sure that the it, questions are related to that and not data-driven, solution-driven, um, that kind of... Yeah, I, I, I sense from this conversation there, there may be some negotiation conversations we okay. want to have as a group and make sure we do have that consensus yep. that we're in the right place or we're not. So I, I think that's the intent of the executive okay. session. So with that, I think we adjourn that. And we think well, you conduct can. yourself right here if you wish. If it's simply a motion it's to go in. It's a motion to go in, yeah. yes. So it's order number 18079, act on a request for an executive session pursuant to Title I MRSA. 4056C in consultation with legal counsel relating to the proposed Downs Credit Enhancement Agreement. And it, yeah, sure. um, if you could also add to that, I believe there needs to be language that says that we will only come back for the purposes of adjourn adjournment. We'll come back to public. Can we adjourn? We, we can, but I think it has to be in the motion. No, I think the law requires you yeah, adjourn yeah. the meeting in public session. Okay. But we'll I do just it want to from, sure. from, yeah. the, from the conference room. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah.